Hello, everybody. I am Chris Randall. I'm the co-owner of Audio Damage <laughs> and the sole product designer for that company. Uh, I have worked with Eventide, Isotope. I don't know why I pointed it. <laughs> we worked together there. <laughs> uh, Tascam and uh, Cycle 74 doing product design and mostly UI, but also product design. And uh, this particular panel will be, if you watch Jules keynote, this is the cat picture portion. This is what we deal <laughs> with the cat picture part of the brand. And uh, these are our panelists and they will introduce themselves. We all have a seat. Okay. All right. <clears throat> uh, I guess I'll start. I'm Nick Dyka. I currently work at Sound Toys in the US in uh, Vermont. And uh, before that, I worked at Isotope for a number of years where I was product design director. My current job, I'm sort of just, uh, ostensibly my job is 50% design, 50% coding. So I am a coder. I definitely wouldn't call myself an engineer, but I'm sort of whatever the plug-in equivalent of a front-end developer is. Um, and uh, yeah, so then before SoundTize, I worked at Isotope for a number of years. I actually started off my career at Cakewalk way back in the day. Um, and uh, I currently also have, uh, I develop mobile apps, sort of. SoundTize takes up a lot of my time, but I do have a, a synthesizer that's on the App Store as well that, was, that I was involved in the design and coding of. Should I continue? Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Mino. Nice to meet you all. Um, I'm a design manager at Native Instruments right now. Um, I have a background in industrial design and consumer electronics. And um, I joined Native nine years ago, created the industrial design team, in-house team, high UX, and um, yeah, um, was probably involved in most of the hardware designs that you see out there. Yeah. And um, yeah, excited to be here. Matthew. Um, <coughs> Matt Jackson, I work at Ableton been there for eight years. Uh, last thing I did was Wavetable. And I used to work with Mino at NI. And I have my own tiny little plug-in company called Surreal Machines. Yes. Dub, Dubland. Yep. Stealing my thunder there. <laughs> uh, it's funny, this actually is an interesting point. The uh, cross-pollination among the higher level design, there's not that many of us that solely design for the music technology world. So those two work together. Nick and I, that's how we met, was me doing contract work for Isotope. What do we do, ARX4, ARX5? Yeah, and Trash 2. Trash 2. Yeah. And the design that he and I codified for RX is still the design. And they're on, what, 9 now? Yeah, so they tweaked it a bit. They've, they've changed it to high DPI, but it's essentially the same thing that he and I came up with back then. So it's like. There's, for people that do this professionally, there's not a ton of us. It actually was kind of hard to find four to sit here and talk to you. <laughs> you, you also used to work uh, for cycling, right? You just yeah, I started with Cycling 74. I was a professional musician for the, my first career. And then I, uh, I was writing for an early music tech blog. Oh, fuck, I forget the name of it. It's a Darwin Gross's blog. And he worked for, he's the, or what passes for the product owner for Plugo at Cycling 74, and he wanted to release another set of plugins for Plugo and had it in his head that I could design. And uh, I'd never touched Photoshop in anger at that point, uh, but as it turns out, I had a knack for it. And I met my partner uh, through that project, and we started Audio Damage immediately thereafter. But mainly to eliminate the middleman of Cycling 74, addition, didn't, VST plugins were really starting to take off as a, as a viable product on their own, and uh, it just seemed silly to have a middleman in the process. <laughs> you know, to, we can just make the plugins without having to deal with Max. No offense to Max lovers. But uh, yeah, so that's kind of the gist of it. Um, and let's get right into it. The, the, uh, all four of us here have different approaches and products that we own, like Matt owns part of a, of a DAW, essentially. It ships with the DAW. He doesn't have to worry about customers so much, other than a lot of angry people, because <laughs> something doesn't load user to wavetables or something. And uh, 
Mino is uh, obviously part of a large team that makes real things. Uh, <laughs> she, <laughs> she, she designed Machina. And is it Machina or Machina? Machina, Machina. all the complete keyboards, track yeah. them, all the software hardware. Everything that's square and black and minimal that Native <laughs> Instruments makes, she touched. And Nick is in Skewland with uh, Sound Toys. So, so like we all, the four of us together have covered the entire swath of what we make. I, I briefly made hardware. We made Eurorack modules for a while and, and learned the error of our ways quickly. So, so there's a little hardware design as well we can talk about. But in any event, uh, what I wanted to talk about first was the difference between making, and you would actually know better than, than us, uh, the difference between making a, a mass market item, something for people that are not technical versus making a product for a musician, a, a creative, you know, who, a person who's inher inherently creative. That's why I say we do the cat brain. We are the people that the customer always sees our work first before they hear the DSP engineer. They see the blog post or the Twitter post or the picture, the Instagram, mm -hmm. uh, someone using it on stage, they see that. You can't always tell what you're hearing, but you always know what you're seeing. And that's our job is to make that. We're the attractor. You know, the DSP has to sell the product, but we have to get them there to listen to it. And, uh, and the difference between making a consumer product versus making a, uh, something for a, a creative, a technical creative person who is in, a musician. Anyone? I can start because we're in hardware. Um, you, were, you worked for Pioneer before Native, right? No, I did not. Oh. <laughs> we got inspired by Pioneer. But inspired by Pioneer. <laughs> but not. <laughs> so um, because Native Instruments started as a software company, and I think hardware only started about 12 or 13 years ago, and it started off first as like more, I think, an experiment in how Core. can we give like a physical tactile feel to the software interface. And we worked with agencies first to just try it out before we understood, okay, there's a demand and there's actually usability aspect wise, experience wise, a huge value to have knobs and buttons and you feel it and you can twist it and um, be really getting into it. And um, so that's how we started our in-house team um, uh, within the company and build it up with like designers myself, like um, or and engineers. You have electrical, mechanical, firmware, soft. And I think the very special thing about Native Instruments is that we have software hardware systems. Right. So the controllers only run with the software. Yeah. And um, so I think that was a huge benefit at first, but also quite a tricky one because you have to develop them simultaneously. And with hardware, um, the, the cycle is just way longer. So when you develop a controller, um, it takes about 18 to 20 months um, from like sketch to development, manufacturing, shipping. And so you have to kind of keep that in mind that right. when you develop that. Right, you have to imagine a future that you have doesn't to imagine exist. the future, but yeah. also make sure the software is ready at that point. And Some also of our software products take 20 months. <laughs> too. I can say that. That's not unique. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, but with hardware, I think one thing is that um, you can't iterate like in, in software and yeah, yeah. code till the like shipping date. You got to commit early. Yeah. yeah. So I found that out the hard way with Eurorack. <laughs> is I've been used to like we would. I have an idea, and then three months later, we have a product, you know. But with Eurorack, I have an idea, and it's 13 months later that there might be a product that bears some resemblance to that idea. And I, I don't, my brain is a bag of cats. I don't have the focus necessary <laughs> to, to bring that entire process to fruition, you know. And it's just not any fun for, for me, personally. How do you uh, keep focus through that long iteration? Um, first, I think you start with an, an ideation brainstorming process so everyone gets involved. It's also like team efforts, so it's not like yeah. me alone in the office. So there are a lot of people involved, and um, especially also with a big company like Native Instruments, you have as a business strategy side, the whole portfolio side. So it's not like um, maybe in the beginning it was more like that, that you have an idea and you run with it. Right. But as you grow your portfolio, you have to also think about the integration of it and how does it play with others and like which market you want to, uh, or which user base do you want to address with. And um, 
So I think um, with a hardware design, you there's a big front loading part of um, um, yeah. tasks you have to accomplish, also user research, big part. Yeah. And eventually you have to commit to a design, to a layout or something, because then you start kick off with the um, electrical engineering part, like PCBs and all, and it becomes lesser and lesser, it becomes more difficult and more expensive to ch make changes. Yeah. So I think that's also the exciting part when you kind of just say, okay, this is it, we're going to stick to this now, we're gonna, like, we've tested it enough, we know what we're doing, this is uh, working, yep. and then you stick to it, and then it goes into development, which is right. more fine-tuning, you get the first like, really functional mock-ups, you, you can start playing with it. So it gets actually exciting, so you, you don't get bored, and you also, the excitement increases because eventually you hold a piece of gear yeah. you're part of and you develop. And I Which think, is the, the best part of yeah. doing real. Is, was push like that? With, were you there for the all of I it? was there, I observed it. I can't yeah. really I say mean, that so I was a big know. part of it, but yeah, definitely. Was, like, it, was it quicker than something like Machine or Because it seemed like two came out very quickly. It came out quickly, but it started oh, okay. maybe earlier. So I mean, it's so it's so plain when you have both of them. Like yeah. like you, they made the one. They're like, fuck, <laughs> yeah, this is what we should have done. And then they made two. Yeah. Which Thank was, you. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the first one was um, was designed in house and then manufactured by Kai. And then okay. we got a yeah, hardware yeah. team. We started doing electrical engineering and everything in house. So. Yeah. So the first one was was basically a Kai parts all bolted together, and then you coded, yeah, coded we, it into submission. We kind of gave them a spec, and we did all the right, right. the software and stuff. Right. But she was saying something like, "Yeah, you know, you commit early, and then you get kind of stuck with something, and then you, you then you get it, and you can play with it." But you made a tweet a couple of weeks ago. You're like, "Oh, with the I'm colors, getting to yeah. the point now where I'm like, stop putting parameters in it that, that I really want to have the, because yeah. I got to get this thing done." And I was like, that's, "Oh, yeah." That's the difference. Is that with a small company, I have the smallest of the four of us, uh, it's just two people, and I can change things up until the day I upload the installer, you know, and I do all the time. Uh, I, I have the, my, all my colors, my, my UIs are all procedural, so I can change the colors, font, whatever, up until I ship, and I, I fiddle with it all the time. It drives my partner crazy, because he'll get used to something he didn't like, and like, oh, this fucking okay. corn flour, really? <laughs> and then, I'm sorry if you have a problem with swearing, but I've, I've worked by myself for 20 years and I'm <laughs> totally feral. I just I have no, no public skills at all. So I swear like a trucker. Anyway, so yeah, I'll, I'll change. And that's why I love a small plug-in company. I am, I'm indie to the bone. I'm a lifer indie music person. Uh, in all aspects of the industry, and like, I just working with Isotope, I was that was my first experience with a truly, although they're not that corporate, not compared to to you guys's, but uh, that was my first experience with Agile, and I'm like, wait a minute, everybody has to go have a meeting about a meeting? <laughs> I don't, I'm the fucking working here, like, and I they gave me, I went to I went to the Isotope offices for. Iris, I think. Yeah, I think you'd already left at that point. What you came while this? we were doing RX3, I think, right? Yeah, maybe. there for like a week. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was the tail end of that, yeah. yeah. And, uh, uh, and I had an office, which was strange. I've never had an office. It was kind of cool. I'm like, dope, I got an office. And then people kept coming by to like, just to say hi. And I'm like, I'm trying to fucking get this Photoshop document to settle. And... Uh, I keep getting interrupted, and then, so I closed the door and turned out the lights, and then people kept opening the door and asking me if the lights were broken. So I just, I can't, I can't, I can't work like you guys do, I just can't do it. it but yeah. It's kind of interesting to be at that, um, you know, because I, sound is very small, we're about 10 people, which is about yeah. the size that Isotope was when I first started there yeah, yeah. in 2007, and it grew to about 50 people by the time I left, and then yeah. now they're, I think, close to 200, so that company's grown quite a lot. Yeah, but you know, as that process starts to come in, I mean, it's hard. If you're coming from like a, you know, a background where you're wearing a lot of hats, people start to become more and more specialized. Yeah. And I think that's the main thing that I've seen in differences between, I mean, I've never worked for a properly big company, but yeah. uh, and from working from small, small companies to medium-sized companies, you know, the bigger the company gets, the more specialized. I noticed that right away 
where people, there's a person that their job is fonts, you know, their job is getting all the text right. That was just strange to me because I, as I'm the design half of our company, so I have to do everything. Uh, and that was, and, but it's all on me as well. If it's a mistake, it's my mistake. I own it. You know, I can't blame someone at the next stand up. You know, <laughs> I don't know if you can blame people at stand ups. Is that cool? You shouldn't. I have no idea. But I think that, that's going, going back to your, uh, your original question about, um, you know, maybe what's different about our industry versus mass market products. Yeah, yeah. I think scale is one of the things. Yeah, when you scale. look at some of these bigger, you know, Silicon Valley style companies, it's like the design team. You know, I consider most of what I'm doing to be UX design, but it's very specialized for this industry. Yes. But if you look at some of these bigger companies, you know, they have titles like, you know, they might have somebody that's just doing research or just an entire team of people doing research. Yeah. They might have somebody that's a UX writer that's just doing copywriting. Yeah. And, you know, I think that we, as a result of the, you know, that we're this really tight knit little niche, I think people, that, that's people like, end up getting a really broad range of skills yeah. in the smaller plugin companies. Our, our anyway. design team is like that. We have yeah. UX, you have hardware, software, UI. We have and then you can bring somebody in design. that uh, isn't a music tech specialist. Like with me, when I was doing a lot of contract work, I don't do anymore, but uh, there's maybe five people in the world that you could call in that would understand Rx and be able to make its user interface. There's, it's a very small pool of people. Uh, me, Matt, uh, he could do it, and uh, uh, Strata, who left for academia, uh, at Florian. Uh, there's like just not a lot of people that, we, cause, because you have to be a musician to be able to make a plug-in interface or a drum machine. You have to understand what a player's going to experience when, they, uh, when they're using it on stage or in the studio or in their bedroom or whatever. And the, the context, you have to know all those things. And somebody that just went to UX class at, at you know, community college just does not have the first idea of how to do this. So it helps to have been a musician, for sure. Um, are you, yeah, are everyone here plays, right? Do you? Yeah, yes. Play. I don't know if I play. Well, yeah, I mean. I use the computer. I, I, yeah. I, I was a professional musician before I did this. So when I fell into it, I knew what a, I knew what a delay was supposed to do, you know? So just from the jump, and that helped me a lot early on, just already knowing what, what everything was. And, and actually, that brings us an interesting that uh, Nick had, Nick had, when we were talking about quite things to talk about for this one thing, Nick wanted to talk about, because he's the only one here that does it, is skeuomorphism. <laughs> that was actually I'm, one of my job interview questions at Sound Toys when Ken brought me in for an interview. Uh, Ken, who's the founder of Sound Toys, had originally come from Eventide, and, um, and Sound Toys is sort of known for having these hard, you know, software yeah. interfaces that look like hardware. He's like, how do you feel about skeuomorphism? And I'm like, see, I would have lost the job right then. Well, and, well, my answer is like, I don't really have like, I don't have any strong religious feelings about flat design versus, right. you know, more physical looking software design. And I think that it's really, I mean, for sound it's part of the brand. I mean, yeah. it really is, um, uh, yeah, it's a very nostalgic, it you know, gear obsessed kind of, um, kind of feel to the products. And, to and so I think it's appropriate for sound toys, but it's not, you know, I've worked on other projects, uh, you know, for myself and others that were a, fl a flat approach or more right. sort of, you know, sort of Mom. futuristic 3D, yeah. you know, FUI kind of approach is, is more appropriate. Love, that's my favorite. Thing. Um, <laughs> but I do think that it's really, I mean, it's kind of interesting that, I think that's actually one of the things I like about our industry is that, I mean, even if you look at tools for other creative professionals, like in, um, you know, like I'm a big Cinema 4D user for actually making the skeuomorphic interfaces, making things like knobs and yeah, switches yeah. and buttons. Oh, that's, and if you look at like Cinema 4D plugins, they're boring. Yeah. They're just like lists of sliders yeah. um, and text boxes. And I think it's kind of, we're in a really weird industry that people, I think, people, I think people tend to feel more of a connection to their tools in a certain way. Because I mean, some of them are literally musical instruments, yeah. but even yeah. effects are like kind of a hybrid between a tool and an instrument. Yeah. People use them as part of their instrument. Right. If that and, and that's, and yeah, the, all the things that Jules talked about in that were we those biases we play to those that's what we we trick people you know there obviously a plugin is just a bit of DSP with some parameters it, zero to one twenty seven they can all be you know just a the logic generic view can be our product but nobody wants to use that you know it's yeah. just it's no fun you know it's not creative and like getting 
accentuating that and taking advantage of people's foibles and tricking them is is what we do. You know, is making it making it dope. You know? I don't really necessarily see it as tricking people. Well, it's not. It's not well, tricking. Can, it's it's can. what it's value added. I sort of think what, what of it in terms of well, especially if you're doing a product that is modeled on an actual then it physical then piece of hardware. Skew is massive. Yeah. Like we did um, the the last product I worked on at Sounders was a little plate where we it's basically the foundation of it is is trying to create a really accurate model of an EMT140, but it's right. got some cool tricks to it. Chris is in the back there who worked on some of those cool DSP tricks. I think um, I made him but... move down front. Where is he? <laughs> there he is. I thought we talked about this. You were, if you wanted to heckle, you had to come down here. <laughs> But, um, but with that, like one of the things, you know, the, I mean, the EMT140 didn't have much of an interface, but, yeah. but when you're working on a product like that that has like a, a heritage to it, it's like it almost is selling it short to, to flatten it out. And yeah, oh, de then it's just it a knob and a switch. Modern UI. You know, it's, it's, like it, I think you can kind of tell the story of that, yeah. that product more effectively in some cases with a... Sure, if you, with yeah, the, you're physical. telling people what it sounds yeah. like. It, it, it helps if they know what an EMT... I, I remember I took a lot of... There was a lot of controversy around the glue in, yeah. um, oh, yeah. interesting. in Ableton. So we, we inherited... That was the first one that, from, that didn't have the dish knobs, right? It, we, we put in a gradient. Yeah, yeah. It was oh, like the oh, the first gradient, gradient that was ever. It's gone now. It's not yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it has a VU meter. Yeah, yeah. And it had we introduced uh, I, knobs I that love, had switches. Like, I love that because you could just use a was, drop down or you know a number box or something. But we had a knob with switches because that's what the hardware had. Exactly. In. We thought like there's something to UI design that. Now it, that's an interesting point though because there is no glue hardware. It, glue is just a a is a, a distillation of. Uh, the idea of hardware compressors is not so. Well, it's based on the SPL, mm. but yeah, so that's where the UI inspiration came yeah. from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, there's something about designing a UI that leads the user. And in many ways, it's yeah. like leading them through navigation so that things are easy to find and they know by the way that it looks what it might do, but also creating an impression that's going to give them an emotional reaction. And um, yeah, it's, it's a weird thing to play with because like a, there are a lot of people who use plugins, like maybe not the Ableton stuff, but who use plugins, like they're collectors, like people oh, who collect God, gear, you know, like yeah. people who use all this stuff and the way it looks is, is a big part of it for them. It's like the album artwork. Yeah. Sort yeah. of. Yeah. We, we encountered a situation where, because we started implementing more displays on our hardware and what do you do then with the interface? Like do you, ha you have real knobs? Yeah. And then you have displays and you show skeuomorphic knobs on it. Like, that, that, like that why, was... why recreate something when you have the real thing in front of you? Right, right. Yeah. So that was like a big conversation and how do we then shift and then only allude. And also, yeah, the question is always like, what do you recreate on, on the screen and what do you actually leave on the physical side? I love the, the machine, the built-ins that show up as a UI on, mm -hmm. on the hardware. That when that first was dropped, it was I was like, this is the best thing I've ever seen. But now it makes me mad. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny, you can, like as a musician, I'm moody. You know, <laughs> my moods are my moods are changeable. That that was with glue. What really worked with that was that in the context of live, which is the most conservative of all DAW UIs, I think. Uh, that's little hint of anachronism was just, it was so perfect with the view meter. It was like. Well, we already had a compressor. Yeah. Like part of my goal was like. To make glue special. Yeah, how do people it's, it's know. It's the only thing with a name in the. When do they use this really technical one with like graphs going around right, and stuff? Right. And when do they use the one with just like the big floppy needle? That yeah, that exactly. Like, you know, that is, that's the only thing in live with a name, isn't it? That, that's the only thing in live with, with a name. With a name that isn't what it does. With a name that is what it is? That isn't what it does. That isn't just a strictly it descriptive. Kind of, it isn't like compressors. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it was a product that we bought from someone else. Yeah, yeah, so it's yeah. got his name on it. <laughs> All right, so we haven't decided whether to skew or not to skew, to, if you were wondering. <laughs> I think one thing that's happened with the whole going flat thing that's kind of been a step back is uh, being able to quickly identify controls. So yes, like having, having that is layers. A, yeah, like I when think you go like layer, 
colors, layers, just, shapes, uh, on sizes. Our, on our next one, I like our last one. I did it flat as a board. There's like I'm actually just towing the line. There's Americans for Disability Act has a. There's actually a law in the United States where, where uh, you have to have a certain amount of contrast between a, con a control and its text. So the so someone that doesn't have a good contrast vision can read it. And, uh, and screen readers can make it out and that sort of thing. And I just like, I found out where the minimum I could have was. <laughs> I'm like this is gonna be just light gray and dark gray and it'll be perfect. Um, but I noticed immediately, and this was, that was the first product I did this with where it was just as flat as can be. And uh, I noticed that you, you like had a hard time, your eye had a hard time landing on particular things. Like the meta picture you could get, but but individual things were tough to, and so the new one I, I amped up the contrast and put just a hint of a drop shadow, mm -hmm. just just enough to make it just, and it just made a world of difference. And so it's like little things you can fiddle with, I guess. But but I think the moral of the story is that to not be married to one, like your interfaces are flat. They're not technically skeuomorphic. It's not a like the way we used to do with a, to render the whole panel in 3D, render a stack of 90 of them and cut out the individual knobs. Yeah, yeah. With like so you had shadows would move. Like the old that. audio damage stuff, you, you had like stuff that was yeah. from, that. from like yeah. a different camera perspective. Yeah, exactly, yeah, and that's just ridiculous. But that's hard to do, like yeah, it's, very, it's, it's very impractical. Pain. So what sound those stuff is like rendered at a very like yes. parallel perspective. Yeah, exactly. They're original, actually interesting. Orthographic, uh, I guess is the word for that. Uh, orthographic, is that right, anyone? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we do like now I, when I'm making you know the knobs for sound those interfaces, it's it's done in a you know in Cinema 4D. I'm rendering them out and then assembling film strips in Photoshop. So oh, that. you do individual knobs and then stack them in. No, no. I, oh, I mean, you do I the render, whole panel. render them as an animation and then assemble okay. them as a film strip. But um, oh yeah, no. But I do individual knobs. Yes. yes. So the panel doesn't have any knobs on it. You render the panel and then you render knobs. Yes. And then you use yes. the same knob for you know, like. Um, and you, because you can do that because of that that flat perspective. Yes, exactly. But the early sound toys knobs, and some of the, I think some of them are still in some of our products, Ken actually rigged up a turntable with a camera, like a you know, vinyl turntable, and put, found some knobs you like, put them on the turntable, and then photographed them at Perfect. 180 positions or whatever, and then made that into a film strip. Oh my god. And it looks pretty good. I mean, like, yeah, but that's, that's the old That's, fashion, that's right? fucking cool as shit, man. <laughs> but, then, but then I think you also don't get the same visual affordance that you could get by like making it explicit, like this is a layer, because like yeah. your eye just kind of like sees the whole thing as like one thing. Yes. Right? And like it, it's digital, so like why not pop this out and say, oh yeah. This is a thing that I can touch, and this is. And and if you're doing everything flat and procedural, then it's no problem just to embiggen it if they mouse over it or make it pop forward, yeah. or give it a tool tip. Any of those mm -hmm. things are possible. They look kind of silly in a skew context, doing things like that. It, like it, your brain can't really. But when it's all procedural, then it's like whatever. You know, I can I can just make the lines three pixels fatter when you roll over it or whatever. It's no problem. Yeah, I think the the I think I would say the main drawback of doing like a skeuomorphic interface is you get trapped in this box. Yeah. Of like conceptually, you have this sort of you know yeah, metaphor exactly. of how the UI is supposed to work, and then you have to you always end up having to break it. Like you need an overlay somewhere where to present some information, or you need to connect some things together. And yeah. So the, the and question is always how far do I actually take this? Mm. Right. <laughs> right. Because we can get ridiculous, you know. There's, there's also that effect where something is like almost real, but it's not quite real and then it just looks kind of creepy. It's like the yeah. Uncanny, uncanny Valley, Valley yeah. kind of. <laughs> yeah. There's actually a lot, like I'm thinking of one in particular, I don't want to name and shame, but, but there's one in particular that is famously Uncanny Valley. Admiral Squality. <laughs> Isn't the production time real long enough for all the rendering and building and then cutting out? The, yeah, the skew is way, is way right, more labor yeah. intensive. It's, and you have to be an artist as well with yeah. flat, you can be a, you can do a code like I I, actually, I don't actually I use Illustrator to do a mock-up early on, but uh, but I actually code our UIs into existence. Just I, I've been doing it so long now that I can just kind of think the UI out, and and I just build and look, build and look, build and look, you know, over and over again. Uh, it will probably be faster to just make an SVG and 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 put it together, but uh, I I enjoy. It. 
the process. It's creative coding, you know, like working with open frameworks or something is just, it's an enjoyable process to code it into existence for me. Um, so there's actually not much iteration for me personally. It yeah. just, it kind of, like as we develop a purview for the product, like here's what we're going to make. These are the general points we wanted to touch on. My partner and I have been working together for 17, 18 years now. So we just kind of got the Vulcan mind melt. He, he is an engineer, but he now, after much trial and tribulation on my part, now speaks musician. So when I say something like that saturation is too brown, he knows what I mean. You know, uh, like, can, you know, can it be brighter? Like, what does that mean to a DSP engineer? Brighter, like what you want it more at 2.5K? What, what the fuck are you talking about? Butterworth? I don't know. Mm. But now he just knows when I say brighter that he can go do something that's brighter and give it back. And I'm like, yep, that's brighter. Good job. So <laughs> uh, I forget the, what the hell I was talking about. Anyone? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's an interesting point because, for example, we are such a big team. Like yeah. We're now starting to work with like design systems because that will, for like, consistency reasons, because we, we, would, we have like the, our signature 16 colors. Right. And like every software or even machina and complete when we like start using them like we like there were slight differences because everyone was using different numbers oh and yeah yeah just to, like to like take that back into like, what does cornflower blue mean to you you know yeah, yeah. So what, like, what software are you using for so we use sketch okay. um, really and also abstract to like really yeah so wireframing and also yeah. filling elements for everything and, um, that's more on the, the software side, right, right. but also we do the whole Adobe Creative C. We also, yeah. for, I mean, for hardware, we use SolidWorks, Keyshot. Um, yeah, but we're trying to, because it used to be all like Illustrator and Photoshop, but yeah. it's not precise enough, and then like, the, you have all these layers, and then it's... Yeah, Photoshop is really hard to manage for right. doing something like a design system. Yeah, I actually, I, yeah. I used to just live in Photoshop, and I actually have stopped entirely. I haven't opened it in months. I do so many drafts just in Max for life, but that's kind yeah. of a no-brainer. Yeah, that's <laughs> it's like the same knobs. You just yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> and actually, Eric. So I don't actually do the UI. I like kind of come up with the idea for the product and then right. say which knobs they should have and kind of make a first sketch. And then the team comes together and we we work it out. And then there's a guy, Eric, that I work with who actually does the final the final thing to the customer UI. Yeah. yeah. That's actually an interesting. Do, like when you're when you're mocking when someone in the company has an idea uh, and you mock it up, do you just use the generics or like I personally I make the whole fucking plugin like from the like Adam's like hey can we, I just made this and it's just generics I'm like no that's not gonna work. Do you have like your own sort of you know default UI you, style that you use to not like? I have no 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 I do do whatever. I, t I fall in a rut though. I've been in the same rut for like six years and then I'll, something new will come along. What got me the way I make plugins now was uh, the Tom Cruise movie Oblivion. G Monk did, a, did the FUIs for his, and I just got obsessed with those. That color scheme and the layouts and everything. And, they, and you look at them, he did a big, was it G Monk or uh, Ash Thorpe? One or the other. Did a big, uh, play-by-play uh, play on the creation of them for the movie. And they're just, FUIs for movies are just comical when you look at them close. They, they have no basis in reality, but for some reason I just love, they're so inspirational. I have mean, just masses of them. Every time I come across one, I, I save it to my hard drive and I just, when I'm thinking of how I want a product to look, I actually go through that file every time. I don't know why. but. Uh, because it's not usable, it's just, it doesn't work in real life. Those, those are not designed to ever be touched. And a lot of them are done after the fact, they just have the actor. Well, know. it's like everything in a movie, right? Like it has to be bigger than life. Yeah, to, like, exactly, the, and that's the, the color across. schemes, that's where we saw the teal and orange first popping out. I tried that out and it just doesn't work when you don't have the depth of field in, of a camera looking at it. Like if it's just flat on a screen, that orange and teal on black is it's a hard it's actually hard to look at. Although our eyes love the color combination of orange and teal. It just when you just do a product that way it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't 
fly. Have you ever noticed how much better every UI looks like when you put it on that picture of like the iPad or whatever? Yes. Like there oh, instead God. of like actually seeing it on your uh, screen? Some of our, the last iteration of our website, I actually took an Urs, Yuhi stole this from me and he told me he did it because I did it. I, had, I took shallow depth of field pictures of a computer screen and that's all the product shots were that because it just looks so much better. And then he went and did it and ruined it for everybody. <laughs> I think all 2D, I don't know, I, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but I think all 2D designers are secretly wish we were industrial designers. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. And yeah, so whenever we so have the much. chance to like put something in a cool perspective, and yeah. it's a physical thing. This, this talk had a real danger of the three of us just interviewing her the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Questions How do you get that, that just a little bit soft feel on the hard plastic? How does that? Yeah, but I think also with us, with 3D, it's... Um, Everything looks better small. Yeah. So when you sketch something on a napkin, it looks amazing. Yeah. But then when you grow it to actual usable size, and you realize, oh, like things yeah. don't line up, and like it looks a little empty here, and the proportions. So yeah, it's always that's what we always also do. Like we build it. Like even in paper markup, or just like a cutout, just to see, is this usable? Is this portable? Is this? Yeah. What do we want to do here? Because yeah, you get tend to like when you also design on a screen, it's like so just it, it always looks nice and crisp and yep, yep, exactly. Ready. But you guys make a lot of handmade prototypes first, like get the get it right before you actually send the yeah. proportion. Yeah. yeah, like ergonomics and all that. Because yeah, yeah. like obviously like on a screen, 3D printing knobs and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we we like try to test that too because um, when you come from 2D into 3D, like. If the knobs are too close, they c you can't use them. You like hit the others, and um, I, I um, might have shipped a product where that was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's also <laughs> that I get the first support email we got was I can't fit my fingers between the knobs. That I was like, yeah, yeah. oh yeah, it's not a mouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah you don't <laughs> click on it. You don't like yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a it going from software to hardware. That's a like very pertinent point. Is you have to. At the very least, you have to print out the thing and put real knobs on it. And that's it, their first step. It's like the guy who's programming drum beats, but he has like five arms going like yeah. on the thing. And then you, you <laughs> try and do it in real life. And you're like, oh, wait, yeah, no, just, you can't do that. Yeah. We sometimes joke around, like, maybe we need to ship like tweezers or like yeah, <laughs> <here> <laughs> it's too small. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah, but I think also there, there are different cases though, because if it's like for performance, then you definitely want the ergonomics to work. But if it's something like a boutique, you know, a collector's item, then you you give in, you make compromises because you want it to be small and cute, and like you yeah. don't, like, you like fill with around with it. That's the fun part of it. So what's an example of that? Um, we don't have one. <laughs> you know, I, I was, that, I was engineer here wearing a like hands engineering yeah. or, you know, the boutique line, like Volker line. Uh -huh. You know, oh, they're yeah. all like, not like for performance, but it's for, you know, like. I'm actually kind of pissed or... at the form factor of the boutiques because like I really want to get them because I, I, I like playing those classic synths, but like I'm like We're an SH-101 with like yeah. a little yeah. slider that has like 10 millimeters of throw. No, thank you. I, I bought the FM one or the FM. Volca. Yeah. And it's just like, it actually makes me angry. <laughs> just like the pots with no knobs on them. And then, uh, like, I was like, yeah, I mean, come the, on, the, God. the SH101 in itself isn't such an amazing, I mean, it's an amazing synth, but like, you can get that sound from a hundred other synths. Yeah. What really makes it great is like, the as soon as you plug it in and you, you could put your hands on it, it's like anything you move is going to make it sound magical. Yep. But like, when you take it away and you give it like, you know, yeah. Like a little switch instead of a slider. Like, it just oh. takes all the love out of it. And that, that's essentially what we do is think about trying to get there from what the DSP engineers hand us. You know? <laughs> I think that's sort of like, you know, there's, there's an element like that in software UIs too, oh, where definitely. the, you know, I think the, like the range and the, the, the scale of controls matters a lot. Like that's, that's a the real most like getting thing. nailing the scaling the, and the in the range. And what's yeah. difficult, all of us are old timers, but what's difficult for us now, I can't I imagine it's not difficult for some people, Nick, uh, is reflowing the UI. Like when I first started there was a there was a screen aspect ratio of four to three and there was a a uh, 
800 by 600, you know, <laughs> it was, the, was pixels. So UIs I made in 2002 are the size of poster stamps on a modern Windows 4K monitor. We, we had that problem with surreal machines. We put it out and we did everything on the Mac and everything and then a bunch of Windows people bought it and they had high DPI screens and they're like, can't, why is your interface yeah. so small? Like, you, it's massive, stupid. what are you talking about? It takes up your, yeah. like, it covers your whole arrangement. And they're like, no, but look at this picture. It's like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we had, uh, I had like about three, four years ago, I had started, when, right when Juice first added Windows High DPI, I started trying to make sure everything could scale to whatever. And obviously we ship a ton of iOS products. All, almost all our product line is also on iOS, identical to the desktop for the most part. So being able to reflow the UI to any, because iOS is a hot mess for aspect ratios. You never know what you're gonna, you don't have any control over the, over the, uh, what the plugin gets. You can't, like in a, in a DAW, you can say, I want it to be X by Y. And in iOS, you get X by Y, and you have to deal with it. So uh, designing a UI that can take, in, take all that into account is actually a fairly difficult, unless it's something simple like a five knob compressor, you know, with a view meter and a switch. Uh, it's a, like to do a big synth, a big polysynth in, uh, that can run on iOS and also a high DPI Windows machine and make no mistake, a 4K Windows monitor is a higher resolution than a Retina monitor. Retina monitor is all pixel doubled. So the, the Windows high DPI stuff is, people run a 36 inch monitor at 3160 by whatever, 24. And your plugin is tiny on that. So you have to be able, the user has to be able to drag that out to the size that they're comfortable with. I have a 4K monitor, but I, I'm old as fuck. I can't see very well. So I run it at a, at a lower, at a, at a bigger scaling than most people would. So I'm gonna get a weird size just as a user. And the product has to be able to cover yeah. any base these, I think, these I think, days. Yeah, reactive interfaces is something that these old fucks, as you said, yeah. just don't know how to do yet. Yeah, that would be something that like, I hope yeah. these people well, Nick, Nick's learn talk, to do a Which better. is, I think, next or later in the day, he talked, he's using React for yeah. Juice UIs and reflowing the whole thing. And that, that we got actually, the breakout view in Wavetable, and that was like the first yeah. time we had to do something that like adjusted, and like there's things that squeeze down and pop yeah. out and stuff. And that was kind of fun challenge to have, but it's a it's hard. I'm glad it's a I don't hard have problem. to do it every time. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's a hard problem for our bigger products now. I I panelize everything. So uh, I work in everything because I'm dealing mainly with the AUV3 on iOS. I I do everything at, at three to one. And so all our small products are just a three to one ratio. And it's a terrible size to make a UI, but it, it, it's easier to start with iOS and work your way forward to the bigger systems than it is to try to, I was just telling him last night, to try to shoehorn a normal product into the iOS context. So we start with that three to one, and then if it's a, something that needs a full panel, I'll do four, three, or two three-to-one panels. Our newest product that's coming out uh, later this year has six three-to-one panels, and the, the user can put them together however they need for the context they're using it in. But uh, like just to deal with just that one thing, just that one format of the four we ship, you know, or all told with all platforms, I think we ship 17 versions of each product. And that's just, just the one. And that drives everything else. So and part of the job, my job as a designer is to find that one thing that I have to build for the lowest common denominator. And for my case, my company, it's AUV3 on iOS. But is what? Is iOS AUV3. That's the lowest oh, okay. common denominator. That's the dumbest format. It's the, the stupidest, least able to bend it to my will. I have to, it's fully, res I have to respond to that. I can't, yeah. I can't uh, engage with it and tell it what to do. I have to just take what it gives me. So, so all the other products, are they, the whole rest of the platforms have to answer to that one format. And you know, you could fork it, or if you got time, I don't got that kind of time to make two UIs for every product. I just don't have it. So, because uh, I'm also doing all the fucking support and, and coding the damn thing and all that, so. <laughs> Uh, let's uh, guess. Uh, we actually are running out of time, so let's go to Q and A. You're up, buddy. I think it's worth noting that 
of the four of us on the stage, every single electronic musician on the planet has used one of our products or more. <laughs> there, is, there is not a living soul that makes music with a computer that, has, that we haven't touched in some way. <laughs> I just, I, I, that's just been tickling me since I the, got the four of us together. <laughs> I was just thinking about that. Uh, hi, uh, Rossi from Near the SP. Uh, one, not really a question, but uh, when VST started, like early 90s, there were basically recreations of hardware. So everything looked like a hardware, or at mm. least resembled like a hardware. Yeah. And nowadays we have completely abstract interfaces that there are plugins that don't even have knobs. Yeah. There are plugins that don't even have switches. There are instruments that don't even have keys. Yeah. And the way it goes. Uh, what we're trying to find uh, is some middle ground, like how much should it resemble a real equipment? How much should it be something ethereal? Is there a line? Is there a procedure to get S to the perfect balance? Yeah. Speaking, speaking strictly for myself, the, we, when we come up with an idea, it's hazier than oh, we're going to recreate the profit five you know and that already built its ui i don't have to i don't have to imagine that i know what it looks like you know um so the idea drives what if i uh, you did a particle synth right yes yeah so i have a synthesizer that's it's so, basically based on flocking behavior so there's a bunch of particles right so you started screen. with the flocking behavior and you're yeah. what can i do with this it, so, it was like something that wouldn't, I couldn't just represent that with knobs. That was right, like, it needed exactly. to be an interactive. Right, you got boys. Abstract thing. And, yeah. And yeah. So, so in that case, the, the idea drives, the, the trick is to keep it from getting away from you. Like I always want to put in eye candy. And like, like I actually, on our next product, there's a macro page and there's, there was, I just didn't have enough macro shit to fill it. So I have a big spot for eye candy, and I'm just like, oh, I can't wait till I get to this, and I'm gonna put an OpenGL context in there, and this shit is on. Using OpenGL, I know, is a bad. I can I can go crazy, you know, with the OpenGL window on a macro page. That's only job is to show interaction. That I can lose my fucking mind with. But is that the right? Is that the right? You know, is that, is that something that needs to be done? Does it make the product better? You know, the, can, a lot of the can. temptation is to, because we, we're visual thinkers and we want the visual to overtake it. But at the end of the day, the customer is not the person that bought the plugin. The customer is the person that's listening to the song. That's my own opinion. Well, we got in this discussion back. Yeah, we were, we were talking we were, about, like, you say you're, you don't care, you're just making products for musicians. I make, I'm a tool maker is the way I think about it. And, and, I, and, and for me, like, it has to sound good yeah. and it has to be fun to use because See, like, people sell, won't use rack. it if it's not fun. You should make Eurorack. You would. <laughs> <laughs> That's the mentality of a Eurorack manufacturer has to have is that the use case is not making a record. The use case is using it, is making music for fun. Uh, I was a musician that made records. So I think of the tools I make as tools. I don't, I don't like, we had always joked that, uh, that carpenters are not hammer collectors. They're carpenters. They make a house. They don't collect hammers. They happen to have a lot of hammers. And that's the way I looked at Eurorack users while we were making it was that these were hammer collectors. They weren't carpenters. And, uh, the, which is bad as from a marketing standpoint, that's not what Eurorack's about. Eurorack is about enjoying the journey. Uh, I, in my head, the journey has a destination, and that's what I'm building for. So, so yeah, letting the UI get away from you is, is real problematic. Well, I think for, we end up, like, if, if I think about, like, a lot of your interfaces, yeah. there's, I think we've ended up with a combination of oh, yeah. <clears throat> sort of controls that are derived from physical controls. Like, even Ableton has knobs, right? Yeah. Knobs are a really weird design pattern it's a, for yeah, software. Yeah, but it's a perfect But it's space. something that musicians have this yeah. like knowledge of and, and history of using. Yes. And, but also, like, you have a lot of interactive controls. So you, know, you have things like graphs. And mm -hmm. so re representing you know, data in a more direct way or things that you can manipulate in a direct way. But I feel like that's sort of like the, the yeah. current state of software and industry. Is there's a mix of sort of old patterns and then also these more direct manipulation or direct display of data rather than it being just hidden behind knobs and I, I worked on this synth at uh, NI 
when I was there, Razor, which has this oh, really like kind of oh, eye candy. Okay. I love the UI for that. <laughs> but actually, it's really useful too. So yeah, the, the goal for sound. that was like, how can we make this really fun, but also like not pointless? Like, and it's also something I'm struggling with, like projects I'm working on now. Like, I how can I add like feedback that like helps you get shit done, but is also yeah, nice Pretty. to use. Yeah, and yeah, it's a, fun. It's a fine line of like. Ra it I think Razor, easy, yeah, but it's yeah. functional. And it Razor is probably the best example of that because it takes a stupid, complicated form of synthesis additive and turns it into subtractive. That's what we tried to do with Quanta. I didn't get even close to where you got with, with you guys got with Razor, but it was to to take something that and that's inherently what we do is to take the complexity of DSP and the process itself and turn it into an enjoyable. Without getting too carried away, what? Oh fuck! Sorry if you had con if you had if you had questions. That's it. <laughs> Sorry, you'll have to go to your grave wondering. Feel free to ask us questions. Whether at lunch or coffee individually. Em Embossed or uh, or fucking gradient. Yeah. <laughs>